Now, you look at that and you think, what in the world does that have to do with church? Revelation is exactly what Chip and Joanna Gaines did. Because they always have the picture of the house in front, and they open it up, and they unveil the new house. It's an unveiling. You know, the revelation, the word means unveiling. In other words, we get a picture, we get a picture, and then we see the real thing. And so we have a picture, and then it unveils to see what's going to take place. You will get the experience in Revelation and unveiling. And today's message will seem like every other message in church, because we talk about Revelation, we want to hear about the apocalypse and all this, and we're getting there, we'll get there. But today's message in the first eight verses are very central to what uh, takes place because I can sum up Revelation in really one sentence. We make it so difficult. People say it's a difficult book. It really isn't. It's really quite easy. Here it is. God's in charge. Jesus is the Son of God. He should be glorified. And in the midst of chaos, we can trust Him and that He wins in the end. That's it. Now, all the other stuff are details. We want to get to the details. And is it going to be this, that, and the other? And the reality of it is the first eight verses just give us a picture of what... And then he launches into these seven churches in Asia, which are representation, which they are seven churches, but they also represent churches that we experience today. But this is what Revelation is. It takes a broken world and makes it beautiful. It takes brokenness at the end, makes it beautiful I'm not working Seth and this isn't the first slide there we go here we go and so we're gonna let the music begin as we start the circus of this it really means unveiling in John chapter or Revelation chapter 1 verse 4 it says John to the seven churches in the province of Asia Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne. We see this passage. And here John got this from an angel. Came from the father to the son to an angel to us. And here he was exiled on the island of Patmos. And these churches represented a characteristic of churches throughout the age. And we can see this unveiling. Are you ready for the unveiling? Now we need it more than ever because these are strange times. As one pastor once said, there's catastrophe on every corner, right? Crisis all the time. And now we have weather on top of it. And how hard it is, wars and weather and illness and all this. Donald Barnhouse was pastor of the 10th Presbyterian Church from 1927 to 1960. And he had a magazine in 1930 called Revelation. And he said what I just said. In 1933. You thought I was talking about right now, didn't you? I was quoting something that a pastor said in 1933. Here the man was writing. He says, we're plunged in one catastrophe, crisis all the times, and now the weather. And he said that in 1933. I tricked you a little bit because we can say, wow, that seems like today. What it tells us is that every generation that's ever lived... Even when Jesus ascended into heaven and the disciples have been looking for the Messiah. And there's been catastrophe from that moment on. And you would say, well, I want the good old days. There has not been the good old days. Let's be honest. We say there has been, but there's been catastrophe all along the way. And everybody has been looking for the return of the Messiah. In other words, we're not unique in this catastrophe mindset. In fact, Donald Barhouse in 1933 thought the end was near. And many people, let's be honest, when, when Adolf Hitler came on the scene, how many times people said that he was the Antichrist? And the end was near. And then we get a COVID outbreak and, and weather bad and things happen and we say the end is near. And I would say, yes, the end is near in 1930. The end is near in 1970, and the end is near in 2021. This book, as time has passed, we have people on the world stage, and all of us are on the edge of our seats, trying to predict 
what's going to take place next. And we can't miss these six purposes that God gives us for this book and the six purposes, six responses that we should have. And in your bulletin, it gives you some blanks to be able to answer those questions. Why? The first one is this. God's not trying to withhold information you need. Look at verse, verse Revelation 1.1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant. As we see here, the revelation which God gave him to show. To show. In other words, God is in the business of showing us. He's not trying to withhold information. If you look closely, the purpose of this book is to show what's going to take place. And we think of revelation as difficult and hard to unpack, and there's some... There are some things that can be difficult, but if we read it in context, we can navigate through this and trust. It is actually to show what will take place. And the enemy of, of us is sometimes silence. We think God is silent. And I'm going to push back a little bit today that God is probably more active than we ever realize, that he is not silent. And if God is silent, then maybe we're not in the word enough, which we'll talk about later. Maybe we are looking at other things rather than his word because God is very active and revealing. When I was younger, I watched a scary movie. You'll be surprised when I tell you what it is. It's called the Buddy Holly story. And I wasn't scared about the plane crash. My mom was here, she would say. I didn't understand to this day. I was probably four or five. I was scared of Buddy Holly's face. I don't know why. To this day, I don't know why. Now, you would look at me and say, is Buddy Holly scary? Anybody think Buddy Holly's scary? <laughs> Probably not, you know. But to me, when I was four or five, it was scary. You see, what I'm saying in this is subjection of scariness is the same way of subjection of silence. What I thought was scary, most people wouldn't think of scary. When we say God is silent, he really isn't silent. Maybe it's you feeling that he's not answering the way you want. And the, and the enemy will try to get us to think that God is silent. He wants to show us. And here we have John, who is a prisoner in the island of Patmos, really secluded. And he's yielded to God, and he hears God's voice, and he begins to reveal what has been said to him and what he saw, which is revelation. So God does make his presence known, and he reveals to us and shows us. It's an unveiling. Chip and Joanna Gaines, this is an unveiling they unveil from the picture to reality. So be rest in God's promise of that. Second, God is not slow about his promises. Now this is the one that's going to be harder for me to convince you in this one, I think. Because you think, wow, it seems like God is so patient and so slow at times. Doesn't it seem like, let's be honest, we're in church. Doesn't it seem like God is slow sometimes? We want things immediately. We want, if we... At a stoplight and it turns red and it's a little bit too long, what do we do? We complain that the light's too long. When I moved to Georgia, I'm so glad for Missouri lights. You all think this is bad, but when I moved to Georgia, it seemed like everything was slower. Everything, even the stoplights, went longer. I'd set the stoplight for like for five minutes. I'm like, what in the world? I wish we had Missouri stoplights in Georgia when I lived there. Everybody was just slower. To, the pace was slower. Life was slower. And I, I'm a pretty fast-paced kind of guy, and I don't think they knew how to handle me because it was like, can you just calm down and slow down a little bit? We actually can have a conversation. And, I mean, and so we want things now. But as he says in verse 1, he says here in verse 1, his servants, what must soon take place. In other words, when he was telling everybody this, he says, I want you to know it's going to happen soon. So when the disciples got this, it's going to happen soon. When the disciples heard Jesus say, I will come again. It's going to happen soon. And we have to define soon. Verse 3, it says the time is near. And really what Jesus is saying, what John is telling us, be ready. It is a plea to be ready. The time is near. Near And you would say, well, Danny, it seems like it's been a long time. Here I am getting older. Will God return? 2 Peter 3, 3-8, three through eight, if you look on the screen, it says, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing, and following their own evil desires. 
They'll say, where is the coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it says since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forgot that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of the water and by water. By these waters also the wor world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and the earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. We are near. And you'd ask me, how do we define near? We see that God's timetable is a lot. And mockers will say, when will his coming happen? When will it happen? It's almost like with the time of the flood. No one saw the flood coming, even though he was building a boat. The signs were there. Noah's, no one knew something was happening. He didn't know exactly when, but the signs were there. He was building a boat. He was saying the water's going to come, and people laughed at him and mocked. In the same way, we see people mocking God, saying it won't happen. It's been so long. Is God really real? Life is not going to happen, and I would say it's going to happen soon because in God's timetable, soon is a lot different than ours. If you look at this, a thousand years are like a day. He says also that in the psalm. So at any moment it can occur. I told you last week, nothing that needs to take place needs to take place. It can happen today. But if it's been 2,000 years since Jesus ascended into heaven approximately, how many days is that to God? That's like a weekend. So let me ask you a question. Is Wednesday near for you? If something big was happening on Wednesday, you would say it's happening pretty soon, right? So in God's economy, Jesus has only been gone a weekend. Now, does that mean it could be another 2,000 years? Maybe. But it could be tomorrow. He was telling them it's soon. Don't dismiss what we think is long. In the scope of eternity. Our fixation on this earth is to look at life through 24-hour window. God's timetable is far, far different. The unfolding of events on earth is in the right timetable. God is never late. And John says he's speaking the word of the Lord. As it says in verse 1, this must soon take place. It is near. We, see, we can see, as it said, eternity. See the past, present, and future exactly as, as planned for the glory of God and works best for him. I've used this illustration before, but I didn't have it today. It's almost like a rope. And eternity is the rope. And life on this earth for all of us, really, just life on this earth, period, in the scope of eternity, is like a little dot on the rope. So we're not here very long. This earth is not here very long the way it is. And we need to realize that time is near. That time is short. Take advantage of those opportunities. Third point, the, the prom, the purposes of the book and purpose that God wants. God wants to offer a blessing to those who trust him. He says in this passage, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take heart to what is written in it, because the time is near. Blessed is the one who hears and heeds. It's easy to hear. Sometimes it's hard to listen because we don't change, but we need to heed. Blessed is if you heed and hear. Did you know rarely does God say to the Lord, blessed is the one who reads it? And here in this passage in Revelation, he tells us, blessed is the one who not only hears it, but reads it. Why is this? Well, we've defined blessing so many different ways. Here is an example. A man was being pursued by a hungry lion and he felt the hot breath of the lion on his neck. And knowing his time was short, he prayed, Lord, he cried out in desperation, Lord, please make this lion a Christian. And within seconds, the frightened man became aware the lion had stopped the chase. And he looked at him from behind. And here the lion was kneeling and praying. Greatly relieved at his turn of events, he was saying, Lord, thank you that this lion is a Christian. And we turned around. The lion was saying, and Lord... Bless this food for which I'm grateful that you've provided. You see, to the lion, the blessing was the man who was getting eaten. It's all a joke, by the way. It wasn't real. 
But to the, the lion, it was a blessing. To the man, it was not. Because we have used the word blessing so flippantly. It's an overworked term. In fact, blessed at a meal. In the Greek, it means to make happy. But it's more than that in the Hebrew. And so we would say, bless the food. The Hebrew word which is used here is a share, which meaning to find the right pathway in the face of chaos. So if we substitute that in for here, that God wants you to be blessed. In other words, God wants you to find the right pathway in the midst of chaos. In other words, chaos will happen. The world will look chaotic. These events that will take place are kind of chaotic. But we can find the right pathway and be blessed for those who take heart because we know, as we set the end, we win because we're in God, because He wins. And so when it says blessed, it doesn't mean, oh, blessed that we're going to have no persecution. It doesn't mean blessed that we're going to have all the money that we need or blessed that our lives are never going to be hard. It just means exactly what the Hebrew term blessed means, finding the right pathway in the face of chaos. The same word is used in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not sit in the, in the counsel of the ungodly. Chaos can break loose around us. And guess what? The true blessing is this, that when chaos breaks on around us, I don't have to worry. I don't have to fear. I can be assured. Even if all my money was gone, even if it's death, Chaos going around around us. I trust in God. We know that chaos will take place. If we believe, and hear, I hear people say this quite frequently, I wish we can get back to normal. And I, I know what they mean when they say that, and I do too. If we can get back to normal. But what is normal? Define that for me anymore. <laughs> exactly. Define that. In other words, so guess what? If there is no normal... If life's going to be chaotic, which the Bible does say it will, and the Bible does say that we'll be persecuted, then he wants to offer us blessing. In other words, he wants to offer us the right pathway through the chaos, that we can have peace. And that's what it looks like. So can we trust him in that? The fourth thing that God's purpose in this book comes is God loves us and he releases us. And this is so good, even though sometimes we forget this. Verses 5 and 6, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. In verse 5, the reminder is what Christ has done. He has set you free. There's no greater thing to know that you are loved and been forgiven. And I say today, as I said last week, this message kind of launched from last week into this week, kind of together. That there's no better place to be than being forgiven of the brokenness that we have. Think about this. That you here today, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of uncertainty, the one certain thing I know for me personally is that I have forgiveness of sins by the blood of Jesus. Not because I'm such a great person, but because of what Christ has done for me and I have given my life to him completely. And that frees me so that when chaos happens, guess what? I am free. I don't have to live in shame and guilt. He's paid for the sins of the world. No need to repeat it and, 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 and understand that when Christ died on the cross, he paid for our sins once and for all. Washed, sanctified. And so often we live in shame and guilt. And there are consequences to our sin. We should not stay in our sin. I'm not saying that. But we don't have to feel the weight of it. He said if it's finished, it's finished. And I think so often in the chaos and the craziness of what we're getting ready to read and the craziness of our world, we spend our life on crutches. Not literal crutches, but almost like spiritual crutches. We feel so far away from God. And we wonder where God's voice is. We haven't heard him. If we're not careful, we haven't been in his word. Satan brings shame and guilt, and we feel like, how can I even be used by God? On the way here, I was listening to Caleb. Mercy Me was talking about a song, Say You Won't. And one of the things he said kind of went with this. 
He says, I think we forget that the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives inside of us. Think about that. That we have been forgiven and released. We have been forgiven and released. Our dog Sandy is a miniature beagle. She doesn't like taking a bath. And she gets dirty when she goes outside even to go to the bathroom sometimes. She comes in and we have to cleanse her to get a bath or cleanse her to, so she can actually experience to walk around the house because we don't want her walking around the house with dirt on her. In the same way, God does not take our sin lightly, but he's willing to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and give us a spiritual bath. Will you allow him to do that? Are you willing to repent from your sins and turn to him and let him cleanse you and let him be the one to make you new and clean? It's great news. He loves us and he's freed us from our sins by our good behavior, right? By our church attendance, right? No, by his blood. And he's made us to be a kingdom and a priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And once Sandy gets the bath, this is my dog, she gets a bath and comes in and she has not complete Probably not a great illustration because we don't give her complete. She almost acts like she's a kid, but she's not complete power of a kid in the house. But um, she has the ability to walk around the house. We have the ability to be in Christ, to receive what is said the kingdom. We have the ability to be priests, to serve God and Father. And to this day, it amazes me that God would call us priests. It would set us up. And he sees us. He sees us as forgiven. And now I can face chaos. I can be blessed. I'm released. I'm free. In him. In Revelation, we see that God will judge the world. Look at verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples on the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. And this passage just says, you know, we as Christians are excited about the coming of Christ. We get excited. When is it? We, we, we say we can't wait till that day. This passage tells us there will be people that will mourn because of him. In other words, not everybody's excited to see Christ. And it says that, look, he's coming with the clouds, as we talked about last week. If you missed last week's message, it's online. And, and, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples on the earth. And the rapture versus the second coming, two different things. And here we have him coming, and all the peoples of the earth will see him. They will notice him. And many will mourn because of it. Same way in the time of the flood. Last thing, Christ is sovereign, the beginning and the end of all things. Look at Revelation 1.8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The Greek alphabet, Alpha is the beginning, Omega is the end. And what Jesus is saying is, I am the end all. Every eye will see me, and then sun unfold, and I am the beginning. Nothing, I repeat, nothing is an afterthought to God. Nothing. Nothing shocks him. Nothing panics him. He is the beginning and the uh, end, and the end, and everything is unfolding to his sovereignty. He's in charge from creation, as it says, to the end. In other words, when we feel chaos, God does not. He has not lost control. And the battle's already won. And sometimes we forget, again, the power that lives in us. We think that Satan and God are at war with each other, which in a, in a sense it is. But we think that they're equals going at each other. Satan is nothing. Nothing. He doesn't fear God. And if that's the case, then we don't have to be afraid of the impending chaos. Because he's in control. He's in charge from creation to this moment. 
All those six principles should be minds kept as we read this rest of this book. Next week, we'll look at Revelation 1, 9 through 20. So where do we go from here? Knowing that these six purposes of this book, this, this book, as this message today was more of a prelude to what is going to take place. And we get, what are our purposes? Reminders for us to apply and the music for our life moves on and chaos comes. The first is we need to be in the word. If we don't hear God's voice, then we need to be in the word and we need to pray. I think if, we're, if we ask ourselves in our culture in which we live, I have a feeling that we spend probably more time looking at news media and social media than we do God's word. And then we wonder, well, how come we can't hear God? Because we're listening to all the other voices. What if we took a break from social media and news media and spent time in the word? Do you think it would change our perspective of the chaos? I think it would. So I challenge you today to put aside all the other forms of communication and look at his word. See what happens. God's word is reliable. It says, as he says, he wants to show us, to show us. Don't give up on God, even though it seems like it's long. And if we're not careful, and I'm guilty of this too, we do devotions as a rushed thing to do. In other words, I do devotions because it's something I do. I check it off my list, and I go about my day. What if we got in God's word and said, Lord, show me what I need to do today and spend time more than just a rushed attempt at understanding God. I would challenge you, because the time is short and the world's so jaded that we need to be in God's word more than ever before, to hear His and be in prayer, fasting in prayer, of how we should respond to the things that happen to us. God is revealing things. And we sometimes get so easily sucked into what I say is the world's logic if we're not careful. There's an illustration of this Catholic young lady who was thinking about marrying a non-Catholic young man. And the mother said, no way, we cannot marry outside of the Catholic faith. And the only way you can marry him is if he's a Catholic. And so she decided that she was going to convince him to be a Catholic. And the young lady went to work, very determined to change his religion. Changes his way of thinking. And she and her mother worked hard together to turn him into a Catholic. They began to break down and says, this is the reasons why I'm a Catholic. Finally, he converted. He became a Catholic. In a few months, they were married. In a few months, they were going to be married. But a week before the wedding, the young lady came sobbing to her mother and saying, well, what's wrong? She says, we can't get married. What do you mean we can't get married? I can't marry him, she answered. I don't understand. He's a Catholic now. She said, we convinced him so much to be a Catholic that now he decided he wanted to be a priest. And that's just a joke of a story. Well, he switched on a dime. Now he's a priest. But and that funny story is this. We can be convinced of a lot of things if we're not careful. There is so much out there, me included, can be convinced that something's true. If it goes against God's word, even if it feels true, it's not true. Be in his word. Not only do you need to be in his word, but we need to worship Christ because he is worthy. And you would say, well, Danny, I'm in church. I'm worshiping God today. I'm in church worshiping God. What if I was to tell you that worshiping Christ is not about attending church on Sunday morning? It's part of it. We need to be here, but worshiping Christ happens every single day. And we need to put him as worthy. As humans, we tend to trust in many things and places. Our confidence is in our abilities, and how we get our jobs done, our bank account, our families. And Revelation tells us that one man, the Son of God, is worthy of our object of complete, undivided faith. He is the center of our worship. In other words, our whole life should be about Jesus. Whole life. Not just church world. Whole life. 
when we seek our jobs, Lord, if this job is causing me not to be close to you, then find another job. If these hobbies are causing me to be not in the center of your will, then find other hobbies. In other words, he is worthy of our worship. As it said in Revelation 1a, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is worthy of praise. And it said in verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, from the firstborn, from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from my sins by his blood. He's freed us, and he is our faithful witness. He is the ruler. He is the one in charge. He is worthy of our worship. He should be the center of our life. Our life should be revolved around Christ and him alone. Do you see the drift that's happened in our culture? And what I mean by that is, and it's happened everywhere. Even, I'd say, 30, 40 years ago, maybe when I was little, that church was important. Just using church attendance as an example. As important and that the family schedule revolved around church activities. Do you remember that? And I'm not saying, again, church is taking the place of God, because church can actually be over God if we allow it. I'm not saying that we need church. But do you remember when our world was revolved, kind of culture was revolved around that? Would you say that happens anymore? Everywhere. In fact, the church is vying for attention because we have... 1,500 activities going on. And you see how slowly Satan has caused the worship of other things to take the place. Now, those things I can mention, the 1,500 things, a lot of them are fun things or good things. They're not bad things. But when they take the place of God, what happens? We're not worshiping God. We're worshiping all the other things. And we're not careful. And because the time is soon, I would evaluate the most important thing that you could do is make God the center. Be in his word and make God the center. Make him your worship. That gives us to the third thing. We need to give all glory to God and not of ourselves. No more self-promotion. It's all about God. I'm living for him. In other words, I change my lifestyle to make sure he gets glory and not himself. So look at verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from the sins by his blood. We give self-glory many times. We want to promote self. We want to climb the ladder. We want to look good. And we need to be on the right frequency, because so often we are spending most of our time lifting self up instead of lifting God up if we're not careful. And it gets us to a point that we need to be on the right frequency with God. Or we'll miss God in the midst of the chaos. As it says, we can have the right pathway through the chaos. All of us have experienced this. I was driving one time with a group of kids from school in the van. This has been many years back. I don't know where we're going, but we went a long way to like a sporting event or something. And we're, I listen to Christian music, have it on there. And, you know, the station changes at some point when you get far away. And next thing you know, the station changed to a song that was not quite Christian. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I wasn't paying attention, and all the words were blaring on the screen. Like, Mr. McCubbin, do you hear what's on the radio? We had changed frequencies. I didn't change the station, but the message that was being delivered was a lot different than the first one. Jesus loves you to uh, something else, if you know what I mean. And how, how easy it is for us to change frequencies, to promote self over God in our jobs and in our homes, even in church, even as a pastor I could do that. But it's not about this. All glory goes to God, even if I'm unnoticed. And we can be ready for the end of the times when the soon is near, when we're in his word, when we're worshiping God in the central of our life and giving God glory, not ourselves. And we find ourselves on the wrong frequency. We're in trouble. The fourth one is we need to look for his return. Look what it says in verse 7. We said this last week. Look, look what he says, look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him, so shall it be. 
look, he says, every eye will see him. And as it says, some will mourn because they will find judgment. And the hour is now to look. Would you live the rest of your life looking for the Messiah? We need salvation now, not just in heaven. So often we delay God's stirring in our hearts and we say, well, I can't, I can't wait to get to heaven or I'll give my life to the Lord later. The salvation comes now from the cleansing of his blood. Verse 6, and he made us to be kingdom and priests to serve his God, serve God and Father, Father, to be the glory and power forever and ever, not only in the present, <coughs> but in eternity. And I pray that we would, if you're here today and you've not given your life to Jesus Christ, that you would decide today that I need Jesus and salvation, the time is now. <coughs> Last but not least, We need to understand that Jesus is all sufficient to meet our physical, spiritual, emotional, and spiritual needs. In other words, as we look at the purpose of Revelation, <coughs> that God is the one that's sufficient. He will meet all our physical, spiritual, emotional, and social needs. Now, I'm going to get pushback, maybe. Maybe, hope not, but sometimes when I say this, people, even Christian people, fight me on this. <clears throat> I do believe that the answer to every question is found in this book. And people would say, well, it's not found in the Bible. Fill in the blank. It's not found in the Bible. And I would say, it is found in the Bible. That we have the answer to every question that we would ever need. And he meets our needs. In other words, when I'm going through hard times, I find the solution through Jesus and his word. <clears throat> when I have worry, when I have fear, when I have jealousy, when I have lust, when I have doubts, when I have brokenness, all of it, the answer to it is Christ. He meets the needs. And we try to fill the void so much in other things. And I pray today we realize this as we come, the time is near. So as we conclude where are you with God? I asked this question last week. I feel like I'm repeating myself there. But here's the question. Where are you with God? Are you ready? Do you think that time is short? Will you get your heart right today? <coughs> Will you look at these six purposes of this book? And as we get into this book, don't miss these purposes. Will you be in his word and make him central? Is there somewhere of your life that you say, you know what, I don't, I don't even know if I want God to return because I would be one of those that are mourning. But you find Christ today. You can find forgiveness of your sins today, free of shame and guilt. Today, would you be willing to, to take that step of faith and say, you know what, I, I want to have a personal relationship with God. I want to be ready because the time is short. And I'm not here today to play with your emotions. That's not what I want. I don't want to do that, but I also don't want you to delay. No more second chances. The time is now. Would you be willing to respond? Oral is too, and I think I've shared this before. Bethany's in the back, and I know Jacob. When they were little, we went to Disney World. <coughs> And they had the Disney buses. At that time, we weren't as familiar with Disney World. Now we know. But we went to the wrong parking lot. We went to the parking lot where the Disney buses were at, and we were staying in a hotel off the Disney property. And there were two different parking lots on two different places. But the buses were going back and forth, and we thought we were in the right parking lot. And we missed our bus. And it was one in the morning. And the bus wasn't coming back. We were stuck at Disney World at one in the morning in the parking lot with two small children. We missed the bus. Fortunately, we did have a second chance there because we knew someone in Orlando and called them up at one o'clock in the morning 
or whatever it was, 2 o'clock, I don't know, and they picked us up and drove us to our destination. Can you imagine if I had to stay there all night camping with two small kids in Orlando? Now you probably go, that sounds fun. It, no, <laughs> not with two small kids. I pray today that story that I just shared is kind of an analogy that you would get in the right parking lot. That you wouldn't miss the bus. Because once you miss the bus, there is no second chances. There will be mourning if we miss the bus and weeping. And I pray that we're ready. Ready to know that God is willing to reveal himself to us as he, as he will in the book of Revelation. We'll talk about next week. That the time is near, even though we think it's, man, it's been so long that it's, it's closer than we think. And God's timetable is different than ours. God has freed us of the shame and guilt so we don't have to walk around with shame and guilt. We can be free in Christ. And that he is the beginning and the end. He will come to judge the world. But we don't have to worry about that. That shouldn't fear us because we have been forgiven. And that all of our worship should be in him, the Alpha and the Omega. So I pray as you come back the next few weeks and hear about Revelation and see what God's doing, that you have this as a base. So when you read it, it doesn't have to be fearful anymore. Because you can honestly say, I didn't miss the bus. And I'm ready for his return. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for this time. And Lord, I pray that as we look at the purposes of this book and we see the six purposes and the six things that we could do to apply to our lives in the midst of those purposes. Lord, I pray that we would examine our hearts as we said last week and we say this week. It's kind of the same conclusion. Are we ready? Lord, I pray that as your word says that you're going to show us what's happened, what happened next. That you've revealed it. And so, Lord, help us to be ready. Lord, you've said that the time is near. Catastrophe has happened throughout the ages. And you've called us blessed because you have shown us the right pathway through the chaos. So, Lord, I hope us to listen to your words rather than the media, rather than social media, news media, our friends, even family. Lord, help us to be true to your word regardless of what we feel. And we will be blessed because you will show us your way through the chaos. So Lord, if you're silent to someone in this room that seems silent, I pray that we would lean hard into you today. Help us to trust you. And Lord, we know that you're, you deserve our worship. By your blood, we have been forgiven. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And we place our confidence and trust in you. And so as we read this book of Revelation, we rest in the fact that we win in the end because of you. And our hope is in you to begin with, not in other things. So help us to trust you this morning. And if there is one here that has, would say, I, I don't know if I'm ready, or that they would seek me out or talk to somebody, they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt they would have eternal life. We could have the hope in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray.